I'm a trained immunologist and for long I believed that there's a close mix between mitochondria and the immune status of an individual. And so what we started doing was we started looking at different aged populations in terms of their mitochondrial health of the immune cells. And so what became very clear is again, most people know as we all age, similar to the muscle trajectory, your immune system loses its ability, right? So that's why you don't respond as good to vaccination or you catch more flu or, or other kind of diseases in your 60s and 70s. All right. Dr. Anurag Singh, I am just thrilled to welcome you to The Better Podcast. Welcome. Uh, sure. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. I've been looking forward to this conversation because we are going to be talking about a compound that maybe some of our listeners are not familiar with. It's called urolithin A. It's something that has captured my attention as of late. I've been using your, from Timeline Nutrition, MitoPure, both these supplements, and we're going to talk about the skincare products as well. But before we kind of get into some of that juicy stuff, let's just talk a little bit about what is this compound, urolithin A, what is it, where does it come from, and maybe we can create a case for why we all should really care about it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, so it, yeah, gosh, 15 years of research led us to this journey. So we started with this idea of bringing the biotech approach to nutrition, sort of the deep dive into foods that have a lot of health benefits. So we started with the pomegranate. And the pomegranate, as you know, probably has a lot of health benefits. It's, you know, from different ancient cultures, it's been sort of seen as a fruit of gods, et cetera. So we started looking into the pomegranate. It's a symbol of fertility as well. A yeah. As well. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of health benefits. We started looking at the clinical literature around pomegranate juice, extracts, and really mixed data. And, and we started looking at all the bioactive compounds. Now, pomegranate has hundreds of bioactive compounds. And so... We, we, when I say biotech approach, we actually started looking at all these hundreds of compounds and starting to figure out which one or uh, which one of them was responsible for this sort of superfood status that you get on the pomegranates. And we zeroed in on these antioxidants or polyphenolic compounds called puniclagins or elegitanins. These are polyphenols that are found just not in pomegranates. They're found in, in raspberries and, and pecans and walnuts. So essentially all the good stuff in the Mediterranean diet. And, and we started studying these uh, polyphenols. And, and what came to, it was actually a sort of serendipitous collaboration with a, with a professor just across the street. We, we are based out of the Swiss Institute of Technology. We gave him these compounds. In addition, we also kind of added in uh, some of the metabolized uh, products and now these polyphenols that uh, once you are taking a glass of juice or eating a bowl of berries for example your gut microbiome uh, will, will harness these digest them and release certain other metabolites that these uh, get into it and one of them was this compound urolithin a and we added them into the mix it was thought it initially uh, that urolithin a was was basically a, a, a waste byproduct of this metabolism through the gut microbiome and so we gave all these compounds to uh, this famous professor, Professor Johann Ulrichs, who's been basically behind the discoveries of Respiratrol and AD boosters. And he came back running to us saying, what is this molecule? Because none of the other compounds are doing anything, but this one is uh, really extending health span and lifespan of, of different models that he was working with. And so that started the journey, and that's how we got interested in urolithin A. So urolithin A is basically, for your listeners, is really what I call a postbiotic. So it's the end product of the metabolism of a lot of dietary components that are found in sort of fruits and nuts, such as pomegranate and nuts. And it's really this gut metabolite, this postbiotic, which is what is key for the health benefits of a lot of these fruits and nuts. And so one of the things that I've heard you talk about is that there is a wide variability in the population at large in terms of their ability to produce this postbiotic. So we're having these polyphenols, and then it really is dependent, as you mentioned, on the gut microbiome to be able to produce this postbiotic. So are there any ethnic or regional areas in the world where we see a better production of urolithin A? Are there genetic SNPs that yeah. someone might have or might not have that would give that would predispose them to better or worse production of this postbiotic? Sure. Yeah. So we have looked at it almost uh, different parts of the world. So 
Uh, we've looked into the French, we've looked into the Canadians, a lot of studies in the U.S. population, U.S. healthy adult population. And, and, and it's, it's fascinating. About I would say in, in the best case scenario, we see about 30-40% of the healthy adult population show some levels of urolithin A coming from dietary exposure. Now, some people what I, are what I call blessed ones. They convert very well. So almost one is to one, they'll convert the, the precursors to the urolithin A. Somebody like me, uh, growing up in India, a lot of antibiotics. Now, I can drink six glasses of juice. My body just refuses to make this molecule. And so in and that's France, because of the seen, antibiot- that's the antibiotic use? Yeah, you're, because of the antibiotic yeah. disrupting the gut microbiome for right. life, probably. And it's yeah. very difficult to reconstitute it back to what is the healthy sort of, quote unquote, the healthy microbiome status. Okay. So even we, though you're of Indian status, let's say, or Indian ethnic origin, the use of antibiotics has potentially disrupted your ability to produce your A. Th- that's my hypothesis. Yeah. Because yeah. I tried eating all kinds of healthy dro- diets, fermented foods. My body just refuses to make this molecule. In. And that's why you need to think about calibrated dietary supplementation through this molecule and other sort of gut molecules that are reliant on the gut microbiome, the digestion. So in the Americans, we, we see only 10, 12%. In the Canadians, it's similar. Now, it may be difference of uh, the food habits of uh, Americans and Canadians versus the French and the Italians, where we see more of 30, 40%. Yeah, that's what we run a study actually in Chicago, 100 people, gave them a glass of pomegranate juice and we only saw about 30-40% uh, could convert even if they were provided the, the right diet. Mm-hmm. Now, back to your question on what is the difference, I think it boils down to gut microbiome diversity and richness. Uh, and, and we have tried to study uh, for at least five years, what is that gut bacteria uh, that is key to it? And in the end, we haven't really succeeded because I think it's just not one bug, it's really the ecosystem because the gut microbiome is so complex, you really need perfect harmony of gut microbiome. So I see this as a postbiotic urolitin A, which also is like a biomarker of perfect gut health. So if your body has the right gut microbiome and you're eating the right diet, you will make it. Yeah, so this is really bad news for our Americans and our Canadians with that 10 to 12%. That's a horrible number. I would be interested, it would be interesting to see because I myself, I'm in Canada right now, of course, travel, you know, travel and, and have lived in the States as well. It will be interesting to see if you take someone who has lived, let's say, in the United States or Canada for their entire life, and we measure them and see, oh, there's like a 10 to 12% capacity for producing this postbiotic. If we then transplant them, as my long-term plans are, which is to sunset (laughs) in Europe somewhere, in Italy, Portugal, France, it will be interesting to see if there's sort of, I mean, maybe this is too cost prohibitive, I don't know, but to see if there's any up leveling in the capacity for urolithin A production, because there's so many things that go into, you know, you mentioned antibiotics, which are just, you know, you have a sniffle and you get a prescription for antibiotics here. There's glyphosate, which is used on our crops and all the sorts of things that are sprayed where, uh, you know, places like Italy, I know specifically Italy, I follow it because my husband's Italian. They're very protective of their food as their hair, you know, to protect the sort of heritage. So they have certain, you know, even lineages of wheat that are different than the wheat that's used, let's say, on North American soil. So it'd be interesting. I don't know if this has ever been studied or you've ever thought about it. But if we change the environment, whether or not that would have a prolific effect on the capacity for urolithin A production. It's a fascinating and probably we haven't done the transplantation because that doesn't fit with the whole nutrition and dietary sort of strategy. But I, I am aware there are research groups, one at the Buck Institute of Aging, that just won a, well, won a few years back a multi-million dollar grant to do exactly what you're proposing is if you could transfer the gut bacteria that are conducive to urolithin production into uh, models of experimental animals which are not, and if you could recover a lot of deficits in mitochondrial dysfunction that accumulate with aging like memory loss, worm mobility. So Mm. it's not a bad idea. We have developed a test that can allow you. So we have taken a very simpler approach. I have developed a test, a very simple blood spot test. It just requires you to prick your finger, spot a few drops of blood, and you can drink a glass of juice that, you know, you can buy comes with the kid actually, or you could try taking a bowl of berries and nuts and see if you're making it or not. And then you can actually see what your baseline is 
because that's also missing today in the nutrition field, right? Everybody's popping with C omega three, but you really don't know where it's all going. So right, right, right. You, how much you really need. So that's what one thing we are approaching. The second thing we are looking at is where na in natural sources is present. So we've actually looked into uh, breastfed mothers and tried to see if giving certain glass of juice during breastfeeding, if it, the molecule will even show up in the breast milk, it's mm. kind of, and it shows up in 30, 40% of the mother's breast milk, it does show up. So, you know, we probably all lived a very, let's say, vegetarian, vegan diet, hunting fruits and eating fruits and nuts. And our gut microbiome has just shifted, as you said, you know, from probably everyone back in the days in our evolutionary history produced these molecules, but we've just slowly lost the ability. And it's found in Iberian ham, for example, because believe it or not, these Spanish pigs are eating a lot of fruits and nuts that are given by the farmers here in, in Iberia. And, and well, I don't want to speculate that that's what makes Iberian ham uh, so tasty, but yeah, that's kind of the origins of, of the molecule. That's amazing. Well, let's talk a little bit about what are some of the benefits that urolithin A has on longevity, on inflammation, on extending health span. And I'll be referencing, so in preparation for our conversation today, I was telling you in the pre-chat, I pulled up your paper that you and your colleagues had published in Cell, so Blue Ribbon Journal. This is not just like a run of the mill, it's one of the sort of top tier journals. And we'll link this out in the show notes, but the title of the title of the study is The Impact of Natural Compound Urolithin A on Health, Disease, and Aging. So I would like to talk a little, let's maybe start with some of the metabolic benefits that we see with, with the consumption of urolithin A, and we can get to, and then I would like to maybe move into skeletal muscle as well. Sure. Yeah. At the base of the discovery is that the molecule urolithin A boosts mitochondrial function, right? And the way you can boost mitochondrial function today from the existing knowledge we have in the field is you can boost it three ways. You can either increase the number of healthy mitochondria. This is a process of, uh, a lot of people call this bio mitochondrial biogenesis. And there are compounds uh, such as NAD boosters and resveratrol that, that do it. And then you can, second way is that you can take the pool of healthy mitochondria and you can make them more efficient. So they're producing more uh, currency of energy, which is ATP. And there are, again, compounds like CoQ10, which hit this sort of uh, more efficiency pathway of the mitochondria. The third pathway, which is also very well conserved, where till we discovered urotinate, no molecule I described to hit on it is a process called mitophagy. And that's essentially the garbage disposal pathway of the mitochondria. So mitochondria over time, they accumulate a lot of waste and they become poor. The, the health status becomes poor. And with aging, this accelerates. And so you're now left with a cell that has a lot of uh, faulty mitochondria that it cannot clean out. And so that the space is being occupied, much like your garbage bin in your house. Uh, if you don't clean it out, your house will not smell. And so that's what urolithinate does is it, it revs up this cleaning uh, process of the faulty mitochondria. And that cleans out the waste that gives more space and your healthy mitochondria come in and you get better mitochondrial health. So at a metabolic capacity, that's the core sort of MOA mechanism of action, how this molecule works. I think that is so awesome. So there's three ways, as you mentioned, just to recap, there's like the number of mitochondria, so you can create more. So you were saying like NAD, resveratrol, urolithin A would be comprised in that group as well. The efficiency yeah. of the mitochondria, so CoQ10, and then mitophagy, which is the, you know, if you just think of, for my Greek listeners, phagos means eating, right? So like the, my, so we're basically like consuming the, my, the mitochondria that are no longer, you know, maybe efficient. Maybe, as you said, they've accumulated so much debris that uh, they're not working as well as they can. And so this is, you know, a parallel to autophagy, which we hear with fasting, we hear with caloric restriction. So when we think about mitophagy, these are, so those would be some other ways that we might induce that would be caloric restriction, extended periods of fasting. Are there any other ways that we might, just in terms of lifestyle, that we might think about? I mean, it's hard to, the thing that I sort of struggle with generally with autophagy and sort of the fasting conversation is like, well, the longer you fast, the more autophagy you have, the more mitophagy you have. It's like, well, how are you measuring that? How is that being measured? So maybe you can walk us through urolithin A with its influence on mitophagy. How is that being measured? And then maybe you might outline, is it dose dependent? Is it like, you know, the frequency with which you're dosing with it? Like talk to us about how we're measuring an improvement in mitophagy with urolithin A, either supplementation or if you're giving, you know, if it's back to the Iberian pigs and we're just giving them <laughs> berries and, and nuts. 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, so we've taken a stepwise approach. We went into worms. We actually did all the head-to-head. So the first models in which a lot of anti-aging compounds or let's say compounds that have a effect on the aging rate are studied as these worm models because they age pretty fast and you can study. So we did benchmark to caloric restriction and you're correct, caloric restriction is the holy grail. It's, it can improve uh, and induce, can improve health span by about 50%. Resveratrol and other compounds are shown to do it by 20%. There are drugs like metformin, which is uh, yeah. involved in glucose given to diabetics. It does it about 40%. The reason we decided to venture and put more effort into urethanase, we saw about a 45% improvement in, in, in sort of health span and autophagy and mitophagy. Now, how do you measure it? Uh, there, there are a lot of uh, tools available to scientists. Of course, as you go from worms to mice to humans, the, the, the set of tools become lesser because there's uh, so much lesser you can do in humans. So in our trials, we measure mitophagy. Either we take peripheral blood immune cells, uh, we look at their mitochondria, and usually the mitochondria that are not in a good status, they will put this eat me signal up front. And so that's what you were uh, saying is that these faulty mitochondria, they tag themselves to be eaten, but it's just that the rate slows down so fa- so much with aging that, you know, you can maintain the balance. So what urolithinate does is it basically revs up the process and now all these mitochondria that have put these receptors, one of them is a, is a molecule called Parkin actually. And, and so that comes from the Parkinson disease that happens, which is a classical autophagy disorder that happens with aging. Uh, and, and, and it removes these uh, Parkin and that allows more near mitochondria. And that also we can measure through things like genes like PGC1 alpha. So we see more PGC1 alpha going up and we see Park and induction, with, with, which is a sign of mitophagy. And then we can measure the oxygen consumption rate, which is a sign of, of, of uh, whether it's in muscle cells or in muscle biopsies, because we've translated it into humans um, or in uh, immune cells, or the peripheral immune cells, blood immune cells. So we can look at that ways into how better the mitochondrial health is. And one of the things I read in your paper in terms of metabolic function is your lithin A supplementation attenuated. So I'm just reading this, just this little piece from your paper, attenuated yeah. triglyceride accumulation in the liver, reduced total cholesterol, low density mm-hmm. lipoprotein and aden- uh, adiponectin plasma levels. So yeah. without a change in body weight. So yeah. uh, I believe this was in the rodents, but I mean that in and of itself. So not changing mm-hmm. anything about the environment. So they're not, you're not making the rats exercise more. You're not giving them uh, fat, like you're not start, you know, you're not fasting them, but just the supplementation of your lithin A. I thought that was really fascinating where we saw an improvement in the lipid markers of these rodents. And I thought that was, I thought that was pretty cool because that's something that we really, as we age in particular, women and men, women as they go through menopause and men as they go through andropause with those declining sex hormones, one of the things, particularly estrogen, one of the things mm-hmm. that we see is sort of this dyslipidemia mm-hmm. and this sort of cardiovascular disease onset that affects both men and women, certainly at different points in their lives. But I thought that was really, I thought that was a really poignant finding. And I wondered if you might expand on that in terms of if you've seen, have we seen that in human, have we looked at that in human trials? And then what is the dosage that we're talking about that's going to elicit? And of course, for rodents, it's going to be different for humans. But what's the dosage sure. that we're thinking about for humans in order to elicit a similar response? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, you know, of course, we've done a lot of research, but there's a lot of famous scientists now working on this molecule. And so the paper you talk about is really the summary of the state of the art of the field where, so essentially, wherever my organs that are extremely rich in abundance of mitochondria are going to get impacted, right? So you have the skeletal muscle, the most, one of the most abundant, the, the, the neurons in the brain, the, the, the cardiac cells in the heart, and then the, the liver and the kidney cells. These are the five organs or five cell types that have highest abundance of, uh, of mitochondria. So with aging, I mean, it doesn't, we all know that, you know, one of the first organs that get affected is mobility or, or ability to, to be attentive and memory loss than all the metabolic disorder. So obviously a lot of effort and, uh, and research has gone into sort of these five sort of categories. And, and so what we see is in different animal models, we have tried to translate into humans, uh, but mostly focused on muscle because again, as I mentioned, muscle is 
easier to assess. The tools in clinical research are easier to assess. The doses we see the effects happening uh, in humans is around 500 milligrams. That's what we see if we, after a month, if we were to take the biopsies in, in sedentary older adults, these are 70 years old, who were supplemented with 500 milligrams. We would see a lot of mitochondrial gene signature in the muscle that would suggest a lot of mitophagy and biogenesis happening, similar to what an exercise regimen would do in, in that same time frame. And then in two months, we see effects in muscle strength and endurance. And so the in addition to your question on the lipid profile, we a lot of the studies we do are in older adults and sedentary overweight. And so these are markers we are looking at. One of the key hallmarks we see in addition to, of course, the mitochondria uh, is impacts on sort of these biomarkers of lipid metabolism. So that's absolutely key. And the second is inflammation. Um, and that's where I think, you know, you may have heard about these hallmarks of aging that people talk about a lot in this longevity field. At the crux of this hallmarks is mitochondrial dysfunction that connects inflammation, lipid uh, dysregulation, almost all these hallmarks. It's the linchpin. It's the it's, thing that connects them all. Yeah. Exactly. And and it's amenable to, to the interventions, right? So you can improve mitochondrial health versus telomere attrition or, or, you know, all these dysregulated nutrient sensing, which are much, or stem cell exhaustion. These are much tougher to, to tackle from an interventional trialist perspective. But it, and so one of the hallmarks, as I was saying, we see is, it, is an impact on inflammation. You measure CRP in almost tri every trial. Older adults are super inflamed. CRP is low. Overweight folks are inflamed. You, you, we see CRP go down. And this effect manifests at about a thousand milligrams. So the sweet spot is about 500 milligrams to a gram a few way. Let's touch on muscle a little bit because this, we talk yeah, about sure. this a lot on the show. Certainly, I'm a big advocate for resistance training. I talk about it all the time. One of the things, of course, that we know as we age, and my audience will be very familiar with this, is <laughs> they're like, oh, here she goes with muscle again. But, you know, this sort of sarcopenic presentation where we see this fatty infiltration of the muscle, we see a total loss of muscle volume as we age, this anabolic resistance that kind of sets in, which is related to insulin resistance, but essentially the, the muscle becomes less sensitive to signals like protein, which is why we need to increase our protein as we age, that kind of thing. This can also be related, of course, to the mitochondria, like the myocyte, you know, the mitochondrial density and receptivity and efficiency in the muscle cell as well. Can you talk a little bit about some of the results that you've seen with urolithin A supplementation on skeletal muscle? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, as I started out saying, when we thought about how to go forward and translate this into, of course, more advanced aging models in humans, we selected muscle because two reasons. One, muscle is, is a very metabolic organ, and so it's much easier to assess. And so one of the first findings was that we improved uh, grip strength, which is like muscle strength, and then endurance by about 40 45 percent and strength by about 10 percent grip so those was for i'm sorry to interrupt you. grip was 40 percent 10 percent grip strength by 10 percent and yeah. and endurance by about 40 percent in these advanced older rodent models yeah and so then we went in and we did the study with the uh, older adults who were sedentary so they don't move around and, and we gave them urotene for two to four months and what we saw was we, we improved it both the hand and leg endurance so we looked at hand so the kind of exercises we, we gave is like a leg press test you know most of the older adults if you, you do repetitive muscle testing they'll fatigue and so you're looking at how long can they do the test so they had 20 percent better endurance and then we saw about a 10 to 12 percent improvement in muscle leg strength in this trial so that's to me is strength as you said you lose about 10 percent muscle mass and strength in each decade of life after your let's say mid-30s right so and this gets double accelerated once you hit 60. so a lot of what we are seeing in older and geriatric populations is as you mentioned rightly can be fixed if there were earlier intervention strategies and i think you're really today's part of that conversation now yeah, I often, what my observation is usually the largest acceleration of aging starts around 40. So we start to like not kind of feel ourselves 30, 35, 37, 39. And then if you're not strategic and careful between the years of like 40 and 50, there can be such a unprecedented decline in quality of life. So this is where I feel, you know, when I'm thinking about what are the clinical applications 
yeah. of your olefin A. I think certainly everybody needs to be resistance training. Every woman, every man, everyone listening here should be resistance training at some frequency. So, like three is good, four is better in terms of like frequency per week. What about when we look at whenever I'm taking my blood work, which is about every six months or so, what mm-hmm. I know to do is I know to lay off the resistance training for like a day or two prior to getting my blood drawn because my LDLs go up because, you know, that's a wound, you know, it's a wound substrate it helps to sort of repair muscles. The other thing that always goes up when I'm, if I don't take time off of training is my creatine kinase mm-hmm. levels. Did we see, were there any changes, let's say, with these sedentary individuals? Did we see a, an augmentation or an attenuation of CK? Uh, it, so creatine kinase, just for the listener, is basically it's breaking down. It's sort of, you know, it, it's a marker that your muscles are sort of either repairing or you've just done a really crazy workout and there's some breakdown that's happened. Did we see any changes in creatine kinase in these individuals? Was that measured or looked at all? So not in the older adults because we didn't, I mean, this was just a five minute, you know, incremental test where they do it in a few minutes. Most of them after a few minutes, they give up. We, we did see in, in multiple models of dystrophy of our collaborators, so looks at muscle dystrophy and they found uh, that urolitin A was attenuating creatine kinase uh, levels. And so we've gone in and actually done a study now in, in uh, elite runners, basically going from, from <laughs> overweight sedentary older adults all the way to young 25, 30 year olds. With the best mitochondria. <laughs> like with, they're going to have yeah, these elite athletes. Supposedly the best mitochondria because yeah. believe it or not, Overtraining, a lot of them do overtraining, and overtraining does induce muscle damage and, mm, yeah. as a result, mitochondrial damage, and, and, and they are all inflamed. And so it's unpublished. This is data that is fresh out of the press. But the prim- primary endpoint was creating kinase because in these athletes who do a lot of high altitude training, you, you see the spike of, as you said, the creating kinase is a marker of, of muscle adapting to training, and, and then it peaks up. And and so if, if it peaks up too much, that means your muscle is getting too damaged. And that's usually a sign for these athletes that, that they need to either lower the training or do some other adaptation. So we see that giving these even elite athletes for four weeks, MitoPure attenuated the, the creatinine kinase. So the recovery was better in these athletes. So we can use MitoPure, which is the supplementation that contains your lithin A. We can use MitoPure as a recovery tool. Absolutely. I, I believe uh, that's where a lot of uh, our new data is coming in. And that's what I believe I'm hearing a lot from consumers who, who are you know, big proponents of been using the, the, that their recovery is something to focus on. And they, a lot of our early adopters, as I call them, are amateur athletes, weekend warriors who do biking and dirt gravel racing and things like this. And, and they swear by it that their recovery is much faster than they were, you know, most of them are in their late 40s, early 50s. Uh, they swear by it. That they're even beating the records from 30s. Uh, so so I, I actually believe part of the reason, I think, is, is muscle attenuation, but inflammation is a big component as well. Yeah, and I think that even just my own personal end of one experiment, my recovery also, as I'm in my 40s now, is different than it was in my 20s and 30s. And our, I think our ability to recover just, I think, naturally attenuates and naturally decreases, you know, over the delta of our lives. So something that you might be able to take in supplement form, or if you're able to derive it, let's say, from the berries and nuts, if you have the gut microbiome that's able to produce it, I think that's also a really smart strategy. Because if you're recovering better, that means that you can get back to the gym earlier, you're reducing your propensity for injury, for overuse, for that CK level, that creatine kinase level, as we've been talking about, to sort of peak as well. So when we're thinking about supplementing, specifically as it relates to, like if we're thinking about urolithin A as a recovery tool, and redirect me here if I'm off base, but would you think about taking it after, so there's like 500 mgs that you're saying, this is sort of the standard dose, so we're taking 500 mgs. Would you think about that taking that after a training session or before, or when would be, if we're trying to optimize our skeletal muscle, which we all should be doing, what is the, so we have the dosage, the 500, and I think you were saying for like really sedentary adults, it's like a thousand, it's like a gram. Uh, in the studies, but what is the timing like? We have the dosage. What is the timing? Look like? Yeah, I mean, in our studies, we haven't split it as pre or post workout. The, the athletes are taking it first thing in the morning. You know, uh, and they take it continuously over a period of four weeks. 
but I think it will work great as a post-workout tool because you, that's where you're, you're kind of getting the damage and the inflammation set in. And so definitely in the post, I, I mean, I'll give another anecdote here. So the scientist, I did this trial recently in Australia, she also works with the elite athletes. And there is this particular elite athlete who was getting very, he's a basketball player, actually voted MVP in NBA recently. He, this gentleman was getting injured a lot. And, and he was put on mitopure and his recovery is much better. His, his injury rates have fallen down. And now he's, of course, at a very high uh, performance level. And so, he, he, you know, typically the dietitian that I talk to, that team say, gives it every day in the morning to all the athletes. So I, I don't think there's a set regimen there, but I think it, it would work better as a post-workout. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, you know, for sort of transparency, that's how I've been using it. So I will go to the, and it's, it works especially well after leg day. <laughs> so if you're someone who splits up your workouts into body parts, as I do, you know, leg day is brutal. Like I am sore the day, like the day of I'm really tired. And then the next day I'm either fatigued or if it's a new work, you know, if it's some new exercise, new movement pattern, I'm usually sore. And yeah. it really helps at least for me, and this is again, just my own experience with it, but I really like it post workout. So I have like my post, you know, my protein shake or whatever I'm having after I work out and then I'll take it then. I mean, it still tends to be in the morning because I work out in the morning, but it's, it's coming after, like I'm putting the supplement after my exercise because that's sort of how I've been viewing it. And just the data that we're talking about today in terms of it being a recovery tool, it just makes sense to me whether that is right or wrong to take it afterwards. But you're, what you're describing here with the NBA player, it seems to be like, you just have to take it. Like it just has to be in your, it has to be in your 24 hour period. It has to be taken at some point in order to sort of reap some of the benefits. Yeah. And we also, we don't have the data, but one of the uh, populations we were targeting is the injured post uh, rehabilitation population, right? So we have taken this is a study actually happening in, in McMaster in Canada. With, uh, Stu Phillips is a famous protein uh, scientist. A and what he does is basically puts a knee brace that kind of mimics it, like uh, putting a, uh, a fracture or immo oh, no, immobilizes the joint. Yeah. Yeah. And that in two weeks induces about, uh, you lose 10% of your muscles. So that induces very fast muscle atrophy. And then uh, the standard of care right now there is just high protein supplementation, which usually works if you get these people moving with some sort of you know physiotherapy and so the goal is can we combine high protein supplementation with with urolitin a at, at these efficacious doses that i was talking about and can we boost protein synthesis rates because people forget protein synthesis is all happening at the mitochondria so right by yeah by boosting mitochondrial rejuvenation or mitophagy in these settings of muscle atrophy if you can boost the protein synthesis, then you can, as you mentioned, even in elder and older adults, you can probably even break this anabolic resistance of aging. So that's the thought. That's what we are doing. Happy to share the data. When we get I can't. Has that been published yet? Has that research um, or is it ongoing? ongoing? But we have done that. Uh, we've already done these experiments in rodent models where you can do similar things and reduce and increase the mitochondrial protein synthesis uh, rates, suggesting that uh, we have a high chance to succeed in this setting. Nice. I want to jump to spine and joint because we're yep. just, we're in muscle land. So let's just go to spine yeah. and joint. I think that's also, you know, because all muscles have to attach somewhere, right? They attach to bones. There's, you know, they cross joints. One of the things that it seems to also do is it seems to also slow down the progressive damage to the intervertebral discs, which are sort of the cushioning in between all the bones. Can you speak to, is it collagen synthesis that's being upregulated, the proteoglycan? Like what, what is happening that is protecting the disc? And, and then the other place I, I'd like to talk about is osteoarthritis, which again, a disease sure. of aging, right? But we see this degradation at the end plates. We see yeah. the joints getting all ratchety and rough when they should be like the end plate should be nice and smooth. So let's talk a little bit about the disc, how urolithin yeah. A can help with disc, like degenerative disc disease and degenerative joint disease as well. So a lot of research on the disc degeneration comes from other groups uh, working on it. It doesn't specifically come from us, but what they are saying or they publish uh, that we reviewed in this paper that you talk about in cell uh, is essentially that even if you look at whether it's uh, an osteoarthritic joint or uh, intervertebral disc degeneration setting, 
the the hallmark people are seeing is is a decline in autophagy and mitophagy, right? That is happening, and by by giving supplementation with urolitin A, you're boosting mitophagy, and that leads to again two things, which I think is a central hallmark. Whether you're talking about muscle joints or or brain, like any example. system, it's coming back to the one thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, actually, too, it's the mitochondria and it's the inflammation, and, right? And, and, right. And it's the same thing happening in the joints. The joints are inflamed. Uh, what we see is a lot of uh, cytokines. So these are soluble markers of inflammation. And we see a lot of these uh, matrix metalloproteinases, which is linked to collagen assembly as well, getting degraded in the joint. And so by supplementing with urolitin A, we, we are recovering a lot of these uh, biomarkers. And we see increase in autophagy, less pain. So the an another finding we are seeing, and these are collaborations we did with on, on osteoarthritis with the Scripps Institute in La Jolla, they actually saw less pain in the joints. They saw better mobility and less inflammation. So, I, but at the hallmark it is upregulation of mitophagy. So I think that's the central tenet. I love that so much because that has that bleeds into so many others. So if you have less pain and more mobility, that means that your range of motion or your the joint capacity for range of motion is being restored, which means you can go to the gym and you can lift some weights without pain, right? Maybe you lift lighter weights, but then you're able to sort of get back in there. So those two things really play off of each other, really like the skeletal health and the joint health and the tendon health, as well as the muscular health as well, which I love. You mentioned collagen and I... I think it would be remiss if we didn't talk about skincare. And one of the things that obviously that all, you know, mm -hmm. as a, like I am a vain woman, like I want to make sure that my skin looks as good as it can for as long as it can is one of the things that we see with aging, of course, is fine cool. lines and wrinkles, degradation in collagen in the skin, elastin in the skin, the hydration of the skin, you know, with declining estrogen as we age also tends to be an issue. Talk a little mm -hmm. bit about, and then I would like to talk about some of the, the facial products that I have sure. been using, by the way, and loving, but we'll get to that in a minute. Talk about how urolithin A can help with our skincare as we're in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond? We got into skincare for two reasons, because I was uh, sick and tired of people asking me, what am I going to feel with the oral products? I mean, how do I measure mitochondrial health? What do I see uh, every day when I wake up in the mirror? And I was like, okay. So probably the first impact people see of aging is, as you rightly pointed out, is this visual, right? So we started actually looking into the skin of 20 year olds, 30, 40s, all the way to 60. And what struck us again, there was that if you looked at the skin cells of a 20 year old person versus a 60 year old person or a 70 year old person was, was impaired mitochondrial energy. So impaired cellular energy was leading to things like impaired collagen assembly in the skin leading to wrinkle formation. And this is uh, skin is also one of the biggest organs for immune cells. People forget that as well. Mm -hmm. And so this is sort of pointed us that maybe if we actually made a topical product, we could directly hit them rather than relying on, let's say, oral uh, product, which probably would get into the skin and do something. But we wanted to make very direct sort of delivery mechanisms. And so we started looking in, we did trials. Uh, we've made uh, formulations that we tested in multiple randomized trials and volunteers uh, from, let's say, 40, 50, 60 year olds. And what we see is that we hit two big pathways of skin aging. One is intrinsic skin aging, which is what I described to you. Basically, that's the loss of cellular energy and the, the, the matrix. Assembly. Yeah, the matrix. So we see an upregulation of mitochondrial energy in the skin, and we see an upregulation of all the collagen related genes that decline with aging. So sort of hinting that the collagen framework is more strengthened albeit, I guess, through to mitochondrial repair. And the second we think see, which is probably 70 to 80% of the aging, which is extrinsic aging, which is basically the aging happening because older of, well, you know, the photo, what we call photo aging or the skin getting exposed to pollutants and skin irritants. And, and so what we did there was we actually induced moderate sunburn the back of the skin of the volunteers and we applied patches of the skin creams and we see a reduction in redness and in, in, in the in sort of the you know the erythema what we call which is basically a hallmark of, of uh, photo damage like those so, x-ray pictures that you know when you know the sort of x i always see with skincare products that like look at the before and after and they sort of have this almost x-ray of the skin where you can see the skin damage underneath the skin under this light versus not that's what you're describing 
Yeah, you can see where the skin is inflamed, where the redness has set in. So the redness meaning your skin is sort of in a wound, wounded form, and now it's trying to recover from, from the harmful photo damage. And so we see about a 15% reduction, which is huge. It's as good as probably putting a, a steroid cream to, to reduce a, your, your sunburn. And so that led us, those clinical data, which we just recently published, and it's under review, uh, right now, and uh, also in JAMA Dermatology, uh, that led us to the skincare products. So we, we developed uh, products that then we independently clinically validated. Uh, and this is the, in a whole range of day and night cream and serum. And that, again, contains very calibrated dose of mitochondria. Yeah. And I will say I've been using the day cream and the night cream pretty religiously. And there is a noticeable difference at particular for like, you know, I'm in my forties. So now like I have little smile lines, like the little sort of what are, I guess they would be called crow's feet, you know, like those things that I've, I'm like, Oh, it's starting to creep up, starting to see those things. I am starting to see a difference in them. Now I haven't actually what I should have done, which I didn't was taken a before picture, but I've been using it relatively, relatively consistently and absolutely love them. So we'll make sure that there's a, a link. Yeah, so we see that in the trials. We yeah. see the we focus um, on the crow's feet wrinkles and we see uh, about a 10 to 20% reduction, depending on the different creams. And we see a, a boost in skin hydration. So we see that this, the skin barrier per se is, is much strengthened. Yeah. Love that. All right. One more area I want to talk about, because I know everybody, you know, especially in the past couple of years has been sort of focused on is the immune system. So you were talking about the skin being one of the primary barriers, right? When we are encountering pathogens, viruses, bacteria, par you know, whatever, parasites, fungi, whatever. The skin is the, one of the primary sort of barriers, which is why this, the skin elasticity or that skin barrier is really important. What are some of the observations, if any, have we seen? So we've been talking about this mitochondrial function being the through line for all the systemic improvements. So we've talked about muscle and joints and inflammation and all of the things. What are some of the things specifically that we see in immune cells? You know, whether it's the adaptive immune system, it's the innate immune system. What are some of the changes that we're seeing with your A supplementation on our immunity or our capacity yeah. for our immune function? I'm a trained immunologist and for long, I believed that the, that there's a close mix between mitochondria and the immune status of an individual. And so what we started doing was we started looking at different age populations in terms of their mitochondrial health of the immune cells. And so what became very clear is again, most people know as we all age, similar to the muscle trajectory, your immune system loses its ability, right? So that's why you don't respond as good to vaccination or you catch more, let's say, flu or, or other kind of diseases in your 60s and 70s. Or even just the cytokine storm that we were hearing about. So, the, I mean, yeah, thing yeah. where the, the immune system just doesn't know what to do. So it overcompensates and goes nuts. Yeah. Autoimmune diseases, cancer, yeah. typically these are all immune diseases tend to happen more as we all age this because the whole immune system gets deregulated. So what we see is, is primarily two things. One, one is we boost this sub small subset of, of immune cells, and these are called as memory T cells. So they, they are self-renewing uh, immune cells. And so they're kind of like your stem cells, uh, but, but restricted to the, to the immune cell pop, uh, population. And they have this intrinsic ability to, to renew at a very fast rate. So if you maintain this pool or you increase this pool, uh, you can fight uh, infections better, you can fight uh, potentially cancer better. And so one of the big findings that, again, we published last year in, in, in a cell journal called Immunity was that the urotinase supplementation led to a, a dramatic, significant increase in, in, in these stem cell memory T cells. And that's these... Immune cells that are, right now, if you look, are one of the holy grails of, of even cancer immunotherapies because everybody is trying to boost uh, these, the small population of, of memory stem cell T cells. The second we, effect we see is more sort of on the immune exhaustion. Now, as we all age, our immune cells just get exhausted. They, again, they put these markers on their cell surface saying, you're tired. You can't just keep dividing and, and, and fighting off. And, and that's why this whole uh, field of uh, um, aging or immune aging, they call it this sort of uh, immune exhaustion happening. And, and so what we see is basically urotene supplementation can dampen these markers of immune exhaustion, suggesting that the immune cells remain in, in a more youthful status so, uh, during the aging process. So these are sort of the two areas where we are working on. We are doing 
two uh, large trials, one in, in Germany where the results probably will come in early next year is looking at this uh, stem cell memory. And then we're running another trial in people who have be beaten cancer. So they recovered with cancer, uh, but because the immune system is recovering after getting a beating from cancer, uh, how fast we can reseed their immune system with urethane supplementation. So these are the two areas we're working on. And what are we looking for? Is it the number? So we were talking before about mitochondrial function and yeah. you were saying the sort of three categories or three buckets that your A can modulate is the number of mitochondria, the efficiency of them, and then the ability to induce mitophagy. Is it yeah. for the, in the immune system specifically, are we looking it's for- It's mitophagy again. It's mitophagy. It's, it's mitophagy. So it's that yeah. immune exhaustion, let's say, is it getting rid of those exhausted cells and then maybe hopefully producing new yeah. fresh ones that are- yeah, so there's impaired mitophagy ha happening in, in these exhausted. When you rev up, they, the immune system gets cleaned away from these exhausted immune cells, and then that allows newer immune cell, healthier immune cells with better function to come in. And on the other spectrum, you know, if you're boosting this sort of these very youthful stem uh, immune cells, and you boost the numbers, then the the immune this the reseeding of the immune system happens even better. So kind of combining uh, similar concepts of improving mitophagy, but on two different immune cells. And with those exhausted immune cells, is this, would you categorize these as senescent cells, like sort of those zombie cells that are like not quite dead, not quite alive, but they're hanging around no. causing all of this. Yeah, sort I of didn't want to use those uh, geek, geek, geeky terms, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can geek out here, sir. You can geek out okay. here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So they are senescent zombie-like cells that, that, that kind of uh, are hanging in, clogging your space, but not doing much. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about T cells. What about B cells? So like humoral, what, do we see any change on the humoral side? No, nah, I haven't looked deep enough, to be honest. Uh, we haven't looked at antibody responses to a flu vaccination or even COVID vaccination. But these would be trials once we see the effect on the global. We are in this study that I mentioned, we are looking at T and B cells, mitochondrial health status after four weeks of mobility. Yeah, that, that would be interesting too, because you, you know, you mentioned the vaccination um, uptake or efficacy, let's say in the older uh, population, part of that, even just for a younger person is like the humoral, like the antibodies just get washed out after a while, which is why they're all calling for boosters all the time. Right. Sure. So if there's a way to, yeah, if we can prolong the window with which those antibody, those B cells are around, I think that would be so Interesting. I think that would be yeah. very, yeah, that's cool. You'll have to invite me back next year when I have the event. <laughs> I would love that. Yeah. So we got some papers coming out that you're looking at right now with Stu Phillips. You got some, you know, the German studies that you're looking at right now on immune yeah. cells. We are definitely going to have you back on. That is awesome. All right. So let's, okay. So we've been talking about all of these different systems. And as we've sort of said a couple of times now, it really does come down to mitochondrial function and taking about 500 milligrams of urolithin A, at least uh, at a minimum on a daily basis, seems to be the sort of minimum effective dose that's going to affect some of these changes that we're seeing. The only other question that I have, and this is just like my clinical hat on, is are there risks like, you, you know, we've talked about five, may, you know, five milligram, uh, 500, sorry, milligrams to a gram daily. Can you overdo it? Like, are there risks to over supplementation? or does it does there not seem to be any risks on the upside so you know two two answers to that question one is this is a natural molecule by definition most natural molecules derived in nature are, are extremely safe as i mentioned uh, you can get exposed to this molecule which you're of the right gut microbiome and eating right. So a lot of uh, LD individuals. Have and you're living in Portugal. <laughs> and you're living in <laughs> Or Portugal. Italy or something. <laughs> or eating the Mediterranean diet, which by the way, has sh been shown to, to, to uh, people in the Mediterranean diet have higher urolithin A levels. Yeah. So, so, you know, I think just this history of use, what we have done is we have done a very thorough safety evaluation that we have also vetted with the FDA. This is uh, the designation that uh, you get with the FDA. That's called the GRASS, which is generally regarded as safe. So you submit all kinds of talk studies and they were all clean. Basically, there is no, usually food ingredients need to have a NOEL, which is no observed For adverse them. effect. Yeah. And, and there there was no, there was, uh, it was hard to establish because you kept, Increasing till a certain amount where you could not give 100% of the diet is only urethane. Uh, and so now in humans, we have done 
about seven to eight different trials and there are multiple running, so a thousand participants roughly. Um, no product related adverse events so far up to a gram dose. Now we, we did a dose escalation study, much like taking 250, 500 gram and two grams in LD older adults. And, and you kind of can keep increasing the, the absorption and the bioavailability. So what we see, and that's why we settle on the 500 milligram to a gram dose is that after a gram, you kind of plateau the absorption. Uh, so the body can, oh, and, and you can imagine, not, you know, probably this is an evolution way of, you can drink. 10 glasses of pomegranate juice, right? Uh, so it's kind of probably nature's way of plattering out what is an efficacious dose. And so I don't think you can overdose it because even if you took the double dose, the absorption you'll see is the same as, as a gram with the two gram, because that's what our data is showing. So yeah, history of use, knowing the absorption profile, like I don't think there's any safety. And we have 35,000 customers today and, and we, we don't think there's any adverse effect associated with this molecule. Yeah, that and I, I ask that because you know sometimes we get really hung up on. So, for example, you'll see in the online space like you have to walk twenty thousand steps a day, and it's like, well, the, there's diminishing returns at some point, right? Like you're still going to get benefit at twenty thousand, but you're going to get most of the benefit at eight. You know, so if you can walk yeah. eight thousand steps a day, you're going to get eighty-five to ninety percent of the benefits of walking for yeah. twenty thousand steps, right? You're still going to get more benefits at twenty thousand, but like the amount of return that you're going to get is reduced. And that's where my question was really based on is like, is there an upper limit? Do we see any toxicity? I think the answer there is no. And, you know, maybe there can be uh, a therapeutic intervention with a higher amount for sort of a, a defined period of time. And then you can kind of get back to this sort of maintenance level of 500 milligrams daily, let's say. Perfectly put. I, I, you know, that's sometimes when somebody, an older person says, oh, I have difficulties moving. I always suggest take the higher dose, the gram dose, because we've seen better efficacy data. Stick to it for a couple of months, and then you can taper it down as like a maintenance dose. And, and I mean, we've had a lot of folks where nothing is working, and they swear by it. So I think that's the right approach. And I will just uh, give a plug for the environment. The, the The product itself comes in a glass jar, which is way better than a plastic bottle. And it, you know, the supplements themselves come in this sort of, I, I guess, it would be air packed container, which is really great for travel. So if you're not taking the glass bottle, let's say with you when you're traveling, you can just take that. You can take that air airtight bag that it comes in, and then if you're, you know, you're going to be at home, then you can just refill the glass bottle instead of throwing the bottle out and then buying a new bottle consistently and like polluting and all that. So I just want to do a little plug because you've also thought about the environment there as well, which I really appreciate. And the other thing I'd like to add on is we've thought also about the product range. A lot of people I know like to pop pills, but there are folks who like to have, you know, their daily routine with shakes and smoothies. And so we have this option of, of the fruit flavored powders oh, that's that, right. contain the, that's that contain right. the same dose and you mm -hmm. can, you know, blend it with your smoothie. And a lot of people like to, you know, kind of bring this diet focused approach and you can blend it there. But we also have a protein shake that gives high 20 grams of whey protein plus urotene or mitopure. It's the the same, the trade name is mitopure. So yeah, you know, people do have a whole range. And if anyone of your listeners or you want to try the, our, our tests to see if you're producing your urotene naturally, it can help you with that. Wonderful. All right. So tell us where we can find, what are the websites if people have questions maybe for you or your team, where they can buy uh, the product. I would love for you to just share that if you can. Sure. Uh, folks can go to timelinenutrition.com. So that's the primary uh, website to learn more about the products and, and the science. But if you want to really dive deeper into the science, you can go also to mitopure.com. That's where we have all the emerging signs and literature around longevity we talked about. Great. It has been such a pleasure to speak to you, Doc. Thank you so much for your time, for your scientific research. And one of the things I really appreciate about a supplement company is the R&D that they put in, like the research and development into it. There's a lot of, we'll just say, you know, I mean, it's an unregulated industry for the most part. So people can just sort of slap a label on it. You can test it. Sure. And, you know, what's in the pill is not actually what the, what's on the bottle label. Uh, so I just wanted to give a shout out to you and the the commitment to excellence, uh, which is a core value of mine in terms of putting out quality research and a quality product. So thank you so much for that. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much.